So um, as Greg said, I am going to talk a little bit about office procedures. And um, this is something that we have found incredibly useful in our practice. Um, and I'd like to um, really acknowledge my uh, partner and the chief of our rhinology division back at Emory, John Delgadio, who um, you all have heard um, You've heard Ray thank his partner, Richard. You've heard Greg talk about how lucky he is to have Jamie and Ian around. And, um, you know, I really feel like as a, as a rhinology team that we push each other um, one step further. Um, and I have, owe a lot to John for, for really kind of pushing the boundaries of office surgery. And um, really, it's something that we can bring to our patients um, to allow them to experience um, an option that does not necessarily involve going to the OR all the time. So hopefully my slides will come. All right. These are my disclosures. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about patient selection. We're going to talk about equipment needs, um, anesthesia, um, and then um, indications for office rhinologic procedures, and then talk a little bit at, at the um, end. I'll show some examples of some things that we can do in the office. So I really feel like uh, office rhinologic surgery is a natural progression of what we're already doing. We scope our sinus patients. We debride our sinus patients postoperatively. We take biopsies in the office. Um, and this is kind of just a natural, um, as I said, pushing the boundaries a little bit of what we can accomplish in the office. Um, and, the, and I'm talking about things uh, like office balloon sinus dilation, but um, a little bit beyond that as well, as you'll see. As far as advantages for the physician and for the patient, um, if you can do things in the office um, that you might have otherwise taken to the OR, it does free up some of your OR time um, to allow some of those bigger cases to get into the OR. Um, the, I think one of the biggest benefits is the avoidance of general anesthesia. Um, patients will oftentimes drive themselves home. They'll go back to work the following day. Um, the cost is lower. We actually analyze the cost in our practice. Um, the cost is lower from a, a health overall healthcare standpoint, and patients are very uh, satisfied with these procedures. So um, when we look at performing rhinologic procedures in the office, um, we found in a study that we did um, that we published in about five years ago that um, this doing this procedure in the office versus doing the exact same procedure in the OR saved the healthcare system uh, up to $5,000 per um, per patient. So, and that was if there was no facility fee in your uh, in your office setting. Um, it does not did not in our uh, setting adversely affect physician reimbursement, um, and the patients were extremely satisfied. Um, in our series, I believe there was only one patient who said that they would not have undergone the office procedure again. Um, so, shameless plug for our um, book that came out in 2013. Um, with our group at Emory um, on office-based rhinology. And a lot of these examples um, and, and um, points you'll, you can find in that book as well. So some of the things that we consider as far as um, when we're trying to decide if an office procedure is the right thing is um, patient, both patient factors and physician factors. So uh, number one is the patient even receptive to the idea. Um, so if I begin talking to the patient about a procedure, um, I typically, um, unless it's, you know, a very simple biopsy of a mass or something, um, typically will offer them either office or the OR. And um, you'll know, as, you know, especially if it's someone that you're seeing um, relatively early, you don't have a relationship with them, you'll know pretty quickly if they're going to shut you down um, on the office discussion, if they just want to go to the OR, and that's totally fine. Um, but whether or not the patient is receptive, their level of anxiety. Um, so oftentimes, um, we're offering office procedures to people that we have operated on the past, people with recurrent polyposis or something like that. These are people that have undergone multiple scopes in my office in the past, perhaps previous surgery, perhaps 
um, debridements in the office. I know what their tolerance is. I know them. They've, you know, if I've been taking care of them for a long time. Um, we also want to make sure that the patients have a thorough understanding of what we're offering them, what they're going to expect, the goals of the procedure, um, and the risks. Um, and oftentimes, office procedures carry the exact same risks as what you would be doing in the OR, so you want to be upfront about that. As far as the actual procedure and um, what I'm considering as the, the person who's going to be doing the procedure, where is the pathology? Um, what exactly is the pathology? Can I anesthetize that area appropriately? Can I make the patient comfortable? Um, do I have the appropriate equipment available? And um, what do I expect as far as bleeding? So um, this might not be someone that you would um, offer an office procedure, but you know, someone who's happy and, and more receptive, um, perhaps. So a couple words about informed consent. Um, as I said, many office procedures will carry the same risks as what we do in the OR. So just because you're doing, it, doing something in the office does not mean that the orbit is inherently safe or that the skull base is inherently safe. So depending on what you're offering, um, these need to be upfront discussions with the patient. Um, I don't trivialize the inf informed consent discussion. Um, I, the vast majority of um, the informed consent discussion that I have for office procedures is the exact same informed consent discussion that, that I have for, for OR procedures. So um, the elements of an informed consent discussion have been published, um, things like ex explaining the actual procedure, discussing alternatives, um, discussing risks and benefits of either choosing the procedure versus not choosing the procedure. Um, you have to make sure that your patient is fully attentive um, and that they're competent to decide um, the right thing for them. So some of the things that we can potentially treat in the office are listed here. This is not an all-inclusive list, um, but we'll show some examples of some of these, things like um, turbinate hypertrophy or polypoid de degeneration of the turbinate, as Ray discussed yesterday, um, polyps, either primary or recurrent, um, mucus recirculation of the sinuses, mucus seals, and others. Um, so anesthesia. Um, this is obviously going to be important in the awake patient. We want our patients to be comfortable. If we start a procedure, we hope to finish it. Um, so the vast majority of times, what we're doing is just topical anesthesia. Occasionally some injections, um, but usually just topical anesthesia. And in our office, that's oxymetazoline and 4% uh, lidocaine. Um, sprayed initially, I then apply it um, on cotton balls or cotton pledgets, which I leave sitting in the nose um, for some period of time. Um, certainly local mucosal injections can be applied. Um, you may consider some type of block, either greater palatine or an infraorbital nerve block. Um, our patients, we do not do any sedation in the office. Um, and occasionally, I've had patients come in and tell me that they took a Valium or they took a pain medicine before they came in, and that was not something that I told them to do. That was something that they did on their own, but um, sometimes they will. As far as equipment, um, what you have in the office um, is important in order to be able to accomplish the procedure. So um, our, we do procedures sitting up in a regular exam room. Um, so typical exam room, um, straight and or zero degree and angled scopes, and we basically have a full um, OR setup of equipment, essentially, um, as far as instruments, and they're individually peel packed so that I can grab what I need and not dirty up the, an entire set. Powered instrumentation, um, things like standard microdebreeders or um, or debreeders that are run off of uh, suction and irrigation, um, coblator, etc. So let's look at some examples. Um, as far as balloon sinus dilation, it's important to realize the indications. Um, and I, I'm, I firmly believe that um, balloon uh, dilation is a, a great tool in the appropriate patient. Um, so I looked at a number of internet sites, and they said um, balloon sinus dilation has the same indications as for traditional endoscopic sinus surgery. So then when you look up indications for traditional endoscopic sinus surgery, this is what you get. 
Um, and I don't think a lot of us are using balloons for CSF leak closure, DCR, um, coenal atresia repair, um, certainly in a, a bony atresia. So most of the time, our balloon sinus dilation is going to be for chronic uh, rhinosinusitis, uh, refractory to medical therapy, or for uh, perhaps recurrent acute rhinosinusitis. Um, just in case you didn't um, weren't aware of the definitions of these at this point, chronic rhinosinusitis um, has has a definition of uh, 12 or more weeks, um, and typically it's our refractory patients that are um, that we're considering procedures on. Recurrent acute is going to be um, an acute bacterial rhinosinusitis um, occurring for at least four times a year um, with. Uh, symptom-free intervals in between. So there are those definitions. Uh, can we go ahead and start this video? So just an example of balloon sinus dilation. Um, this is going to be a right maxillary, and we'll um, actually show this in the lab here shortly. So that was a cotton, basically just a piece of cotton with um, topical anesthetic and decongestant. I oftentimes like to pull the, the uncinate out a little bit just to um, give myself a little bit more room to place um, the device. So this is the eclarant device with the lighted wand. Um, and interestingly, you can't see a whole lot. Obviously, you guys know if having if you've done this, you can't see a whole lot. The video is not all that exciting, right? But you you can see the the um, guide wire going in. We'll typically turn off the lights, verify that um, that we see the um, the actual. Um, light in the patient's maxillary or frontal sinus, um, and then go ahead and advance the balloon, which you can see here. Um, and then I um, go ahead and, and have my assistant dilate. Um, I do two, di or, uh, two um, inflations of the balloon and then withdraw. So. What about things like uh, maxillary mucus recirculation? This is something that was mentioned before. Can you start the lower video, please? Um, so this is a circular flow of mucus between the, a natural sinus ostium and a secondary, usually surgical ostium. Um, and you can see two examples of it here. Um, and that's basically due to the normal um, mucociliary directional flow. Some patients will be symptomatic with this. Some people will just get recurrent infections. Some people will not have any symptoms at all and, and do just fine. Um, and the treatment, uh, as Brent said before, is to create a single ostium. If you don't look for it, you're not going to see it. Um, so it's important to use your angled scopes in the clinic, um, not only during your maxillary entrostomy, but as patients are healing as well. Um, and mucus recirculation does not necessarily only have to occur in the maxillary sinus. This is a patient who had a um, chondrosarcoma removed um, and actually had mucus recirculating between the septectomy site and a uh, residual superior terminate. Can you start this video? So this is taking down um, in the office um, the bridge between the natural and surgical ostia in, in a case of mucus recirculation. Um, and this is something that, um, like I said, we can easily do. So you can see that posterior um, ostium, the surgical ostium, is separated by a thin, uh, relatively thin band from the natural ostium of this left maxillary sinus. So basically just using a side biting punch, we take that down. This is something that um, I probably do once a week, once every other week in the clinic. Um, like I said, if you don't look for it, you're not going to see it. Um, I'm going to actually skip that one. What about polyps? Um, so yes, we can remove polyps in the office. Um, so certain primary polyps can be removed in the office, um, things like po solitary polyps, especially if you can see the attachment site, or limited polyps, especially in patients that may not be appropriate candidates for the OR, whether they're, uh, they have significant comorbidities, pregnancy, or you're um, trying to kind of get through a period of, you know, something else, uh, say, for example, someone whose daughter is getting married soon and wants to feel good, but it can't quite go to the OR, something like that. Um, so, so symptomatic relief um, prior to definitive surgery. Or in the revision case, if you've already operated on the patient, they already have the beautiful boxes that Ray talked about, um, but then they have recurrent polypoid disease. Um, this is something you can certainly do in the office. The vast majority of times we can accomplish about 80 to 90% of what we would accomplish in the OR. Um, so 
And, and the rest of the remaining disease can be treated medically. Um, so I do explain that to patients, that we may not get quite the complete clean out that we would get in the OR. A lot of people ask about bleeding with uh, polypectomy in the office. It's really minimal. Patients are sitting up. They're not having inhalational anesthesia. Um, they are, as long as they're not super anxious and having um, hypertension or tachycardia, the bleeding is really, really minimal. Go ahead and start this video. So this was a patient that I um, have been taking care of for a long time. I did her prior surgery. She's got standard um, CRS with polyps, and she actually did really, really well um, for a long time until she had two young children who are in daycare and have recurrent infections, and then she kind of started to get these recurrent URIs, and eventually her um, soft tissue disease came back. So um, this is using the... Um, the uh, polyp vac device with the um, suction and irrigation running through it. It's relatively, um, it, it, so it's a, it's a little slower than your standard powered uh, microdebreeder, but it works really well. Um, one thing I would caution you to is that um, in a recurrent AERD case, those polyps tend to be a lot more fibrous and they're more difficult to remove um, in this manner. So this patient came in symptomatic, left asymptomatic on that day. Middle turbinate polyps, Ray talked about this yesterday. This is something that our group is describing with the Sydney group. Um, these can be easily removed in the clinic. Oftentimes they're isolated, especially in these um, atopic cases. Um, people will typically present with nasal obstruction, sometimes hyposmia, and this is an inflammatory process. Go ahead and start this video, please. So this uh, particular polyp looks pretty impressive. It's kind of a big, pedunculated thing. Um, and pretty soon you'll realize that it's just got this little attachment to the middle turbinate. So um, easy to remove in the clinic. Um, also, primary sinus surgery in certain cases. Um, this was a case, um, one of my partner's cases, basically just did a maxillary entrostomy in clinic, traditional instruments. This looks like any other surgical video, um, but it's, uh, it's done in the clinic. So primary maxillary entrostomy for um, a fungus ball in an elderly patient, or um, Mucus seals can also be treated. Our, um, our uh, institution has a series of mucus seals that have been treated. This is a video of that particular ethmoid mucus seal being taken down in the clinic. We've all seen these. Um, we've seen them. Um, they're, they come into the clinic. You can see it right there. Um, you have the scan um, and relatively easy to marsupialize these. maxillary uh, mucus seal with some fungus in it. And then um, this is the series out of our um, institution with um, 35 mucus seals drained, including ones with orbital and skull base erosion. Um, so these are not the cases you start with, um, but they're the cases that you may eventually get to. So appropriate patient, appropriate pathology, um, high patient satisfaction, um, and uh, like I said, um, start, starting small and progressing to the more difficult ones um, is how we've done it and certainly uh, can be done in your clinics as well. So thank you.